Okay, so let me say again, happy Sabbath to all. And I hope you're enjoying Sabbath at this time. It's already Sabbath. And that uh, it's wonderful to see each other here on screen, despite our distance. Uh, we are increasing in number. Uh, we are intentional in worshiping God. Despite our situation, we have a new normal. And so we are doing it online. Worship is not about a place. We know that one in, in John 4, 4, that the true worshipers will worship, will worship God in spirit and in truth. And so we have now the truth. And so in spirit, we are together here, though we are in different places. Uh, tonight, we have a wonderful message. Again, let me share to you my screen. This is about the end time messages from Jesus. And we are doing this Vespers and as an evangelism because the General Conference actually encourages all of us to do evangelistic or evangelism in all its phases. And so we do our Vespers evangelistic in nature, our, our Sabbath evangelistic in nature, even our midweek prayer meeting. Everything we do should be evangelistic in nature. The church manual is so clear on that. And so tonight's topic is very wonderful. Blood on the moon. Why not blood on COVID-19? All right? Because I do not read COVID-19 in the Bible. I read blood on the moon. Uh, is there any such thing as blood on the moon? Before we proceed. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you at this time, at this early part of the Sabbath day, humbling our hearts because we really are human beings full of weaknesses even a few hours before this. We would easily commit some mistakes in our words and our actions and our thoughts, being human beings. We are full of weaknesses. So, all of you would like to be covered again by your righteousness. Tonight, we need your spirit to dwell into our hearts and mind and open and see things from the perspective of eternity, not from earthly perspective. And we see things positively, not negatively. And we take things positively also so we'll be able to appreciate the things that you want us to understand tonight thank you dear lord for answering our prayer that you will anoint my lips thank you for the prayer of sister joy in jesus name amen okay uh some all right <clears throat> It's uh, a lot of preparation for this message tonight. I'm making this an ESL type, so non-native speakers of English can follow this one, especially the kids. Some words are not for them, but at least they will build some vocabulary on this one. A study is very important regarding prophecy, which is based on the seven seals of the book of Revelation. The number seven in the Bible denotes completeness or perfection. We haven't known that one yet. So there are many sevens in the book of Revelation. The seven trumpets give us the complete political history of the world with its warfare and strife. And the seven seals give us a complete religious history from the time of Christ down to the end of the world, including the final events. Let us read about the first seal in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold, 
a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Briefly, the white horse represents the first period of the history of the Christian church. Beginning about AD 31, when the apostles received the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. Whiteness in the Bible always represents purity. As we read in Psalm 51, 7. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. For three years, the disciples had been taught by Jesus Christ himself. And now they went forth preaching the gospel. The pure gospel as it had never been before. The whiteness of the horse denotes the purity of the faith of the apostolic church. The white horse went forth conquering and to conquer. We read in Colossians 1.23, not move away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. This fitly represents the conquests of the early Christian church in its purity going into all the world with a gospel message of salvation. As we read, during the first century after Christ, the apostles carried the gospel to the very outskirts of civilization. In Revelation 6, 3 and 4, we read, when he opened the second seal, another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Under the symbol, something is represented that is not as pure as the first. This horse went forth to take peace from the earth and to kill. Let me read from Bible readings, page 348. As whiteness in the first horse denoted the purity of the gospel, which its rider propagated, so the color of the second horse would show that corruption had begun to creep in when the symbol applies. It is true that such a state of things did succeed the apostolic church. Worldliness came in. The church sought alliance with a secular power and trouble and commotion were the result. James Worry, the historian says, according to church history, century, section seven, at the end of the second century, Christianity began already to wear the garb of heathenism. The seeds of most of those errors that afterwards so entirely overran the church, marred or destroyed its beauty and tarnished its glory were already taking root. During the second century in the church established by the apostles, the leaders began to strive among themselves for power. There were wolves in deceiving clothes. The Apostle Paul prophesied that after this, his departure, false teachers would come into the church. According to Acts 20, 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. We read it in Acts 20, 29. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Just as it was prophesied soon after the death of the apostles, 
the original purity of the gospel began to be corrupted. In Thessalonians 2, 7, Paul says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Even in Paul's day, the errors were creeping in. And by the second century, you know what happened? The church of Christ was so far corrupted that the color of the horse representing this period of the church is no longer white. Paul very definitely prophesied that there would be apostasy in the church after the apostles died. And thus it came to pass. Dr. W.D. Killen says, between the days of the apostles and the conversion of the Constantine, the Christian commonwealth changed its aspect. Rites and ceremonies of which neither Paul nor Peter ever heard crept silently into use and then claimed the rank of divine institutions. This second period in the history of the Church of God, beginning about 100 AD, extends to the time of Constantine in AD 323, when a complete union of church and state was effected. This is represented in a symbol with a great sword that was given to the rider of the red horse. When the principles held by the church are enforced by the sword of the state, you know what happened? Then the church was tr has truly received power to take peace from the earth. We have a message here in the chat room. Uh, yes. Again, we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I looked and behold a black horse. Black horse is a symbol of spiritual darkness. In Revelation 6, 5, and 6, it says, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. By the time the third seal opens, the church has become very corrupt. How rapidly the work of corruption progresses. The value of these basic elements were high. The basic spiritual food was scarce. Black is the opposite of white. The seal opens about the time that Constantine, the pagan emperor of Rome, accepted Christianity. When Constantine became a Christian, then religion became very popular. And the heathen flocked to the churches. Under the third seal, the black horse the church became black with apostasy and sin. It took up practices contrary to the law of God. Practices which Jesus and the apostles had never taught. The balances in the hand of the rider of the black horse denote the union of the powers of the church and state under one authority. The selling of the wheat and barley indicates that the love of money and of this world and its pleasures would be prevalent in the church during this period. The oil and wine represent the graces of the spirit, faith, and love. And God did not want the spirit of worldliness to destroy entirely the graces of genuine piety from the earth. James Worry, the historian, says of this period, Christianity had now become popular. And a large portion of those who embrace it only assumed the name, while at heart they were as much heathen as they were before. Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a flood. Some of the pagan superstitions that they brought into the church at the time have been handed down to the present. You notice them? And are still practiced in many churches even today. 
The historian A.C. Flick says, the mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. In, it is this period of the infiltration of paganism into the church that it is represented by the black horse. It is not a matter of great surprise, therefore, to find that from the first to the fourth century, the church had undergone many changes. Again, we quote from the historian Flick, Christianity could not grow up through Roman civilization and paganism without in turn being colored and influenced by the rites, festivities, and ceremonies of old polytheism. Christianity not only conquered Rome, but Rome conquered Christianity. I would like you to take notice of this picture. This being colored by the customs and practices of the heathen is represented in the prophecy. Can you imagine that? By the changes in color from the white horse to the red horse to the black horse. You know what happened? Philip Schaff has this comment. The Christianizing of the state amounted to a paganizing and secularizing of the church. The mass of the Roman Empire was baptized into with water. And it smuggled heathen manners and practices into the sanctuary under a new name. It was during this time that holy days, holy images, indulgences, and scarlet and purple garments. Garments were introduced from heathenism into the church. Bible readings, page 248 says, the black horse fitly represents the spiritual darkness and the generosity that characterized the church from the time of Constantine till the establishment of papal supremacy in AD 538. So we have this period of the third seal covering that part of the history of the church. From the time of Constantine, beginning in AD 323 to papal supremacy, in AD 538, papal means Pope, supremacy of the Pope for kids. Now we're reading again in Revelation 6, 7, and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I looked and behold, a pale horse. Revelation 6, 7, and 8 says, and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Now, this fourth horse, the pale horse, represents the period in church history beginning in 8538. When the bishop of Rome, that is the Pope, became the supreme ruler of both the church and the state. We read in Revelation 6 and 7, and the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with the beast of the earth. The fourth horse is a pale horse. This must indicate the sickly condition of the church during this time. The rider is death and hell from the Greek word Hades meaning grave, followed after. This indicates the great mortality during this period. Mortality means death. You remember? A lot of people being murdered this time. Beginning in AD 538, when the severe persecution of the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages lasted for 1,200 years, from 538, AD to 1798 took place and millions of God's people gave their lives for their faith. Can you imagine? By this time, the Bishop of Rome had become so powerful that even kings and emperors dared not disobey the Pope. The church was united with the state. The Roman emperor supporting the Pope. While the heathen continued to come into the church, 
bringing their holy water, their holy garments, their temples, and all the traditions of paganism. In AD 538, the Bishop of Rome, that is the Pope, became the recognized head of the churches in all the world. And those who refused to recognize his authority were persecuted. Now, it cannot be erased in history, even in the internet. Thus, the period known as the Dark Ages was ushered in, and the Bishop of Rome, that is the Pope, ruled to the hand of iron. The world was subject to him, and he ruled over kings and majesties. Anyone who opposed him was condemned to death or tortured into submission. The true saints of God who believed in his word and were unwilling to worship the images or accept other practices of paganism were most severely persecuted. Oh, what persecution there was when the church and state were united. It was worse than when the pagans were persecuting the Christians during the first century. When the church and state were united, you know what happened? And the pagans accepted Christianity in such numbers. Everybody was compelled to accept the doctrines of the church as set forth by the Bishop of Rome. In the terrible time, there was persecution unprecedented in history. Very terrible persecution. Historians tell us that as many as 50 million people were killed. Can you imagine that? more than COVID-19, persecuted as heretics. They were cast to the wild beasts, burned at the stake, crucified upside down, and tortured and slain in every conceivable inhuman manner. All this in the name of God. This persecution continued for centuries in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, in England. In fact, in all the countries of Europe, Millions who still believe in Christ and in the Bible only who would not accept the traditions and false teachings of the church were cruelly mistreated. This period of the pale horse with its rider death followed by the hell or the grave vividly symbolizes those dark days of the Inquisition when the millions of people gave their lives because they held fast to the purity of the apostolic gospel as taught by Jesus. In other words, if you hold on to what the Bible says and what the apostle says, you will be persecuted like what, they, what happened to them. This period extended from 8538 when the Bishop of Rome, that is the Pope, became supreme ruler of the world to AD 1517. When God caused men to begin to oppose the great church and state power, which was persecuting the saints of God. Now we see here, next is the fifth seal. In Revelation 6, 9, we read, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. And for the testimony which they held, they were martyrs. It was a horrible persecution that had been carried on during the time of the fourth seal. Millions had died. The fifth seal gives a view of the martyrs from the 16th century to the time the papacy was finally restrained. The description continues in Revelation 6.10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O oh Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood in those who dwell on the earth. Notice here, under the fifth seal, the very blood of the martyrs try, cried out to God for revenge. This is not an uncommon illustration. You recall that in Genesis, it tells us, that Abel's blood cried out against his brother Cain. These martyrs were not in heaven, but under the altar where they had been slain. The persecutors were not being punished in hell, fire either. 
or there would not have been a cry for revenge. The death of these billions of martyrs became the means of bringing many who were in paganism to Christ. When they saw the children, youth, and the aged who were slaughtered for their faith, showing such fortitude and patience, many hearts were touched. But so terrible was that persecution that Jesus says in Matthew 24, 22. And unless those days were shortened, the persecution was cut short. For God instituted the Protestant Reformation. The very blood of the saints who had died during this terrible time cried out to the Lord to put a stop to the persecution. I thank God that Martin Luther came upon the scene of the action of this time and began to preach against this iniquitous system. In 1517, Martin Luther went to the large Roman church in Wittenberg and nailed his thesis on the door of the church. 95 theses, a thesis which protested against the Roman religious system and its corrupt practices. And that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in the mercy of God. Those terrible cruelties were stopped. Other men besides Luther were responsible for the progress of the Reformation. Men who were courageous and faithful. Among them were Huss, Wycliffe, Jerome, Tyndale, Ridley, Rogers, Hooper, and many others. Some of these paid with their lives for their faith. Huss and Jerome were burned at the stake. It was not even safe to travel during this time, lest they be taken and slain. And we thank God that these men were courageous enough to preach the plain word of God. We are thankful for the Protestant Reformation. The pale horse of the fourth seal continued during the dark ages from 8538. When the church united with the state to enforce its beliefs on all until 1517, when the Protestant Reformation began, the fifth seal with the blood of the martyrs crying out, began in AD 1517 with the advent of the Reformation and extended to the opening of the sixth seal in AD 1755. The opening of the sixth seal is described in Revelation 6.12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake this great earthquake took place on November 1, 1755. Then occurred the greatest catastrophe that had ever been known since the time of the flood. On that day occurred a great earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal, which not only shook Lisbon, but also much of the Earth's surface. Nelson's new Lost Leaf Encyclopedia describes it thus under the article Earthquake. The Lisbon earthquake, which occurred on November 1, 1755, is the most notable earthquake in history. There have been many severe earthquakes in the history of the world, but all agree that this earthquake in 1755 takes first rank. Yes, very large earthquakes have occurred after this, and maybe there will be bigger ones, but the prophetic time in which it occurred and the following signs that Jesus prophesied and which are also predicted in this same order in the OT and the NT, that is Old Testament and New Testament. There is no doubt that this is the earthquake mentioned in Revelation. Sir Charles Lyle describes the Lisbon earthquake thus, a violent shock threw you down into the greater part of the city in the course of about six minutes. 60,000 persons perished or died. The sea first retired and laid the bay dry. It then rolled it in, rising 50 feet or more, or, or more above its ordinary level, that is tsunami. This earthquake occurred on a holiday 
when the people were gathered in the cathedrals. That must be Sunday. And many thousands were killed in these churches. Then those who rushed to the waterfront to save themselves, you know what happened? Perish. That is, they died with a tidal wave that swept in. A ship captain said, the fear, the sorrow, the cries and lamentations of the poor inhabitants are inexpressible. Everyone crying. Oh, what will become of us? Neither water nor land will protect us. An eyewitness, a ship captain, describes this way. Fire seems now to threaten our total destruction. The conflagration lasted a whole week. The people were filled with fear, falling on their faces in prayer. For they thought that the end of the world had come. Of the extent of the quake, Jane Orr says, the effects of the earthquake of 1755 were distributed over nearly four millions of square English miles of the Earth's surface, greatly surpassing anything of this kind ever recorded in history. Most of Europe was shaken severely from Scotland to Asia Minor, and even the inland lakes and streams far beyond the disturbed area were greatly agitated. In Africa and even in the West Indies, the quake was felt. Now, the sixth seal was opened with a great earthquake. But let us read in more. Let us read more in Revelation 6.12. It says here, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Here is another event that was to take place during the sixth seal. We find from history that these events took place just 25 years after the great Lisbon earthquake. Noah Webster tells us the dark day that is on May 19, 1718. So called an account of a remarkable darkness on that day extending over all New England. The true cause of this remarkable phenomenon is not known. This darkness began about 10 o'clock in the morning and continued throughout the day, finally becoming a, so dark that people could not see their hands before their faces. The dark day in, in, in Northern America was one of those wonderful phenomenon of nature, according to Herschel this world famous astronomer, which will always be read with interest, but which philosophy is at a loss to explain. In other words, the darkness became so great that the farmers left the work in the fields, lights became necessary, the cattle went to the barns, chicken went to roost, and people could not carry on their ordinary labors. It became nighttime, this dark day. Scientists are still trying to explain this dark day. They cannot say it was an eclipse, for the moon was full and not in the proper position in relation to the sun for an eclipse. The sun, moon, and earth have to be in a direct line in order to produce an eclipse. More than that, an eclipse lasts only a short time, but this darkness lasted from 10 o'clock in the morning through the rest of the day. The Connecticut legislature, which was in session, thought the end of the world was coming. They made a motion to close the legislative session, but Abraham Davenport stood up and said, Mr. Speaker, it is either the day of judgment or it is not. If it is not, there is no need of adjourning. If it is, I desire to be found doing my duty. I move that candles be brought and that we proceed to business. So they brought in the candles and, and continued the work through the day, even though it was pitch dark. There are still more events to occur during the sixth seal. In Revelation 6 12, we read again, and the moon became like blood. 
after the sun was darkened and when night came it would be supposed that the moon would appear but it didn't finally when it did appear about midnight it was blood red a fitting symbol of the great amount of blood of the saints shed during the dark ages which just preceded this time of this event milo last week says the moon which was at its full had the appearance of blood the alarm that it caused and the frequent talk about it impressed it deeply on my mind the moon continued blood red the rest of the night scientists cannot explain this but the bible tells us that under the sixth seal it would happen and so it happened still another event is foretold under the sixth seal we read in revelation 6 12 the 6 13 i should say and the stars of heaven fell into the earth you see stars falling occasionally but no doubt the greatest exhibit of falling stars occurred on november or in november 1833 Have any of you ever heard of grandparents telling about the falling stars? Did you hear that from your grandparents before? Or not really? Maybe you see this at night sometimes, but not as vivid as this one. Not as many as this one. Of this event, Charles A. Young, a professor of astronomy at Princeton University says, probably, the most remarkable of all the meteoric showers was that of the Leonids on November 12, 1833, the heavens were ablaze with falling stars. People thought surely it was the judgment day. The number was estimated as high as 2 million on an hour or five or six hours. The spectacle, according to Encyclopedia Americana, witnessed throughout North America, excited the greatest interest. Hundreds of thousands of shooting stars fell. Some observers compared their number to the flakes of a snowstorm <laughs> or to the raindrops in a shower. In other words, the spectacle was of the sublimest order. It began about nine o'clock in the morning and continued until well after daylight. According to Elijah Burrick, the most sublime phenomenon of shooting stars on November 13, 1833, covered no inconsiderable portion of the Earth's surface, covering the entire vault of heaven with myriads of fireballs. And it continued until well after daylight. Imagine that. This most remarkable of all meteoric showers took place. Now, we have had a great earthquake. The darkening of the sun, the moon turning to blood and the falling stars in the same order as prophesied by Jesus and the Old Testament scriptures. There is still one more event mentioned in the sixth seal. In Revelation 6, 14. We read, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. This event is still in the future and will take place in connection with Christ's second coming. We are living now, just before that event takes place. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24:29. Immediately after the, the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now this agrees with what the prophet John has told us. Just after the great tribulation of the dark ages, these things would come to pass. Jesus continues telling us what will happen next in Matthew 24, 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn 
and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So these signs have been completed and we are now waiting for the final event, the second coming of Christ. We have seen all these great signs in the heavens, but Jesus tells us to expect more. In Luke 21, 11, we read, and there will be fearful signs and great signs from heaven. Great balls of fire have been seen coming down from heaven and rolling along in the ground and crosses have appeared in the sky. God is hanging out signs to wake up this world. But I sometimes wonder if it will not take a powerful bomb to awaken some of us. Are we awake yet? The world is greatly concerned over the flying saucers and other peculiar phenomena appearing in the heavens. There's no doubt that these are some of the great signs that God is hanging in the sky to warn the world in a startling manner as possible that the end is near. Saucer shaped and cigar shaped objects are seen streaking across the sky. Some are blazing red, others are blue, and still others are orange. The Associated Press recently reported that the world has never seen so many startling sights in the heavens as have been seen in recent times. Don't you think that COVID-19 is also a sign? Pestilence mentioned in, in Matthew 24, right? We are living between the falling stars of verses, verse 13. And the heavens rolling back. It says here in Revelation 6.15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men. Can you imagine that? As a scroll in verse 14 of Revelation 6. Now in verse 15, we read also. Every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. This surely describes the wicked at the time of Christ's coming. They will run in, the terror, in terror and try to escape from his presence. So we have completed the sixth seal, beginning in 1755 and extending to the second coming of Christ. It began with the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. Then we have the darkening of the sun and the moon turned to blood in 1780. The falling stars in 1833 are the next of the signs. We are now waiting for the fulfillment of the last sign, the heavens departing as a scroll at the second coming of Jesus to this earth. What about the seventh seal? Nothing is said about it until the eighth chapter of Revelation. So we will skip the seventh chapter that speaks about the sealing of God's people. The entire chapter describes God's last work in this world and the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. All this transpires between the sixth and seventh seal. Now we come to Revelation 8, 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about an hour. An hour here. <laughs> How long is one hour here? In prophetic time. Counting a day for a year as prophetic time is figured. According to Ezekiel 4, 6, a half hour would be approximately a week. What causes that silence? Half hour, week, one hour, two weeks, right? Let us read Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, when he will sit in, uh, I should say, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, all heaven will be empty. And according to the belief of many theologians, that is what causes the total silence there. At the end of the sixth seal, Jesus and all the angels come to this earth. And during the seventh seal, heaven is empty. There is silence in heaven. Time is running out, friends. I wonder if we are ready. I think of the words of Jeremiah 8:20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. Do not wait 
until it happens like this. The signs have nearly all been fulfilled with the exception of the coming of Jesus. There are no more events of importance under the sixth seal except the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope this is not true of us, that the harvest has passed, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. What a regret, brothers and sisters, if it will happen to us. It cannot be long until Jesus will come. Do you realize this? Are you ready to meet Jesus when he comes? Have you confessed all your darling sins to Jesus? Have you accepted him as your personal savior? Have you asked him to cleanse you from all your sins? Have you decided to live a life of holiness? Especially during Sabbath day. And free from deliberate sinning. Have you promised not to come back to your old life of sin and live a new life as Christian? If you have decided all of these, then let me pray for you. Let us pray. Our dear God in heaven, we have been reminded through the series of seals in the book of Revelation throughout history since the time you left us with your son going to heaven and he promised he will come back. It's been more than 2,000 years, O oh Lord, and events have been fulfilled exactly as prophesied. And now we are now at the end of this prophecy, meaning that it is not too long from now, Jesus will come. If you have come to your glory in many ways in our words, in our actions, and we have been indulging in our human nature, of our likes, of our pleasures, of our wants, not sacrificing ours of our Lord, please forgive us. If you have been inactive in the church many times instead of following you, that we make disciples of all nations, we've just been SDA all the time, sitting always at the back you without really taking part or maybe we've been going around anywhere not participating in your work oh lord please forgive us it is a sin not to do the right thing because sin is not just transgression of the law sin is also lawlessness sin is also not doing the right thing sin is also doubt sin is also unrighteousness Stopping to praise also sin. There's a lot of definition of sin in the Bible. Oh Lord, please forgive us. Those who have accepted Jesus as a personal Savior, I pray that you will strengthen their faith and continue to walk and accept you as a personal Savior and live a new life, a new creation. All things have passed away. Now we are new creatures. We are Christians. We are newly newly renewed by your spirit and we are having this new life with you waiting for your coming and enjoying eternal life with you in heaven i pray oh lord this congregation tonight also listening pondering being convicted of the message that we continue to walk with you until you come thank you oh lord for answering our prayer tonight all we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.